everybody, this is Deb, and whoo, I'm back on my Pinnacle Studio, so let's see how things go. Now, the hard drive has not been replaced yet, okay, but they're sending it to me, so I'll get that replaced, you know, in a couple days, and everything will be back to normal, hopefully, after that. So, let's see how this goes. This is going to be a little longer one. I know some of you like the shorter ones and everything, but I'll tell you, this one's going to deal with some history, if you're not aware of everything that's been going on or the plan that's unfolding, you may find the second half of this really interesting because I'm going to go through some documents that you may not have seen before, but they've been out there for a year. Now, I did a video on this so several months ago, and it went pretty well, but you know, I want to get this information out again because people need to know this, okay? This is all starting to unfold, and back then... People were taking it on faith that things were happening, but now we're seeing what's happening. So I wanted to put this out there again, give you the information. The links, as always, will be down below, so you'll be able to check them out for yourself. I had to revise a few of them because any of them that were on the House committees that, you know, if it was a document that the House committee had, you have to alter the address a little bit. You have to put Republicans and a hyphen in front of it. So I did that in this one. But you can also go check out my other video. It's called, Is Jeff Sessions Sleeping? And so that was the one that this is kind of the similar information on. But here we go. <sighs> of course, there is a new Spygate prosecutor, John Durham. And this is the guy who is going to be looking into things. Well, you know, actually, it says, you know, on Monday, Attorney General Bill Barr assigned top special prosecutor John Durham to investigate the origins of the Russia probe. Well, he didn't exactly, you know, he may have officially said it then, but this guy has been on the case for a while, okay? And if you look at this Daily Caller article, and this gives some really good background to him. He has some pretty good credits to his name. And he's uh, done a lot of high-profile cases that he's prosecuted. And, of course, he was really involved in the Whitey Bulger prosecution case. So he's used to uh, some big names and uh, people that are not real nice. So I think that probably he's going to have some interesting things that he's going to bring up. Uh, Durham also investigated a case at the request of former Attorney General Michael B. Mukasey in 2008 involving videotapes of the CIA destroyed that depicted the torture of terrorism suspects. He further examined the CIA's handling of detainees at the request of former Attorney General Eric Holder under the Obama administration in 2009, according to the New York Times. Well, it's really important, and I know a lot of you are probably all of a sudden going, wait, wait, he was un he did something under Eric Holder? No, we don't want that kind of person in. Yeah, actually we do. And this is one of the reasons why it's very important that Michael Horowitz, the Inspector General, is also an Obama appointee. We've got to have people from the other side who are going to say, yeah, this really did go on because when it's somebody from our side, of course, you know what's going to happen and you know what's going to happen with them anyway, because they're going, you know, he's going to come up with things that the Democrats don't like. And of course, they're going to all of a sudden see his name as mud. But being able to point back to, yeah, this guy was handling some things under Holder, that does help a little bit, you know, because he he seems to be more. Um, you know, bipartisan here instead of, or non-political actually, instead of siding with one side or the other. Anyway, so this, this article I'll put down below and you can check it out. It's going to have, you know, it has some really good information about him. But um, this probably is something that may have sparked Barr to do that. And this is a document, of course, from the Office of the Inspector General, and it says, investigative summary, findings of misconduct by an FBI special agent in charge and assistant special agent in charge for failing to ensure contact with a known drug trafficker was handled according to FBI policy for confidential human sources and for failing to report and preventing the reporting of misconduct misconduct allegations. Let me bump it up just a little bit. It, it's pretty short, and it just basically says that, you know, we had... 
The Department of Justice Office of the Inspector General initiated an investigation upon receipt of information from the FBI alleging in substance that a known drug trafficker claimed to be corruptly involved with the FBI. During its investigation, the OIG learned that an FBI special agent in charge, SAC, and an FBI assistant special agent in charge, ASAC, responsible for supervising the handling of confidential human sources, <laughs> they're they love all these alphabet soup things, allegedly failed to report the allegations involving corruption to the FBI inspector division of the OIG and directed FBI employees not to report the allegation. So really, you know, there's some corruption here that in the FBI because they were not to report the allegation. The OIG found that the SAC and the ASAC violated FBI policy when they failed to ensure that contact with the drug trafficker was handled according to the FBI policy for handling the human assets here, including documenting contacts and communications with the CHS and failed to report and prevented the reporting of misconduct allegations to the appropriate authority in violation of FBI policy. The OIG completed its investigation and provided its report to the FBI for appropriate action. Unless otherwise noted, the OIG applies the preponderance of the evidence standard in determining whether Department of Justice personnel have committed misconduct. That's dated April 30th of this year. Okay, so I'm kind of wondering if maybe that is kicking off this whole thing that Barr appointed this Durham guy to look into it further. So I don't know if that's the case or not, but I thought it was an interesting document that I wanted to share with you. And just in case you're not aware, I mean, most of you understand this, but just in case you don't, the inspector general, every department in the government has an inspector general for it. I mean, like the major departments. And so, like, there's an inspector general for the Department of Justice. There's one for the State Department and the different departments around. This one just happens to be the Department of Justice, OIG, and that is Michael Horowitz. So, anyway, keep that in mind as we go because that's going to be important. And what the inspector general does is they look over the conduct of the people and the things going on in that particular department. They investigate it to make sure that there's not problem areas. Now, Horowitz is the one who is the inspector general of the Department of Justice, as I said, and he is actually, I believe right now, he's in charge of all the inspectors general right now. I mean, he's like the head one. And he also is in charge of the whistleblowers. So that's like his specialty. So that's kind of an important thing to remember, too. He was appointed by Obama, but both sides of the aisle respect the man and they believe that he is a fair and honest guy. Okay. So anyway, let's go on because we need to talk about what went on in the past. This is from the Department of Justice, and it's dated, notice this, May 17th. Interesting things always seem to happen on the 17th of every month. So this May 17th is the two-year anniversary of this event. And what was this event? This was the day that Rod Rosenstein announced the appointment of former Department of Justice official and FBI director Robert S. Mueller III to serve as special counsel to oversee the previously confirmed FBI investigation of Russian government efforts to influence the 2016 presidential election and related matters. Okay, and here was the statement that he made and what he was doing and why he did it. Okay, so then just remember that was May 17th. Well, You know, things were going along and Bob Goodlatte here was looking into things because at the time, Bob Goodlatte was the chairman of the House of Representatives Committee on the Judiciary. Yeah, Jerry Nadler is now the chairman of that committee. So look at the difference in quality, right? Anyway, so Bob Goodlatte was in charge and he wrote this letter to Jeff Sessions and Rod Rosenstein, and this was dated July 27th. So this is after the special counsel has been appointed. 
And they say, Dear Attorney General Sessions and Deputy Attorney General Rosenstein, we are writing to you to request assistance in restoring public confidence in our nation's justice system and its investigators, specifically the Department of Justice and the Federal Bureau of Investigation. We need to enable these agencies to perform their necessary and important law enforcement and intelligence functions fully unhindered by politics. While we presume that the FBI's investigation into Russian influence has been subsumed into special counsel Robert Mueller's investigation, we are not confident that other matters related to the 2016 election and aftermath are similarly under investigation by special counsel Mueller. The unbalanced, uncertain, and seemingly unlimited focus of the special counsel's investigation has led many of our constituents to see a dual standard of justice that benefits only the powerful and politically well-connected. For this reason, we call on you to appoint a second special counsel to investigate a plethora of matters connected to the 2016 election and its aftermath, including actions taken by previously public figures like Attorney General Loretta Lynch, FBI Director James Comey, and former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. And so he goes on, and then he lists, I'm not going to go through the rest of this, I will put the link down below. You can read that for yourself. But he lists 14 things that he wants them to look into. So basically he goes through and he gives the reasons why he thinks there should be an investigation. And then it's a seven-page document. And again, it's really good to read. I mean, Goodlatte's letters were really full of information. So always good to read this. And if you want, I think I read it in the previous video, you know, the other video that I did a few months back, but um, I have so much more that I want to include, and so I'm just going to touch on the 14 things they asked for. So the things that they asked for, the, they were asking for a second special counsel to look into these 14 things. Then Attorney General Loretta Lynch directing Mr. Comey to mislead the American people on the nature of the Clinton investigation. Number two, the shadow cast over our system by justice concerning Secretary Clinton and her involvement in mishandling classified information. Three, FBI and DOJ's investigative decisions related to former Secretary Clinton's email investigation, including the propriety and consequence of immunity deals given to potential Clinton co-conspirators, Cheryl Mills, Heather Samuelson, John Bentel, and possibly others. Number four, the apparent failure of DOJ to impanel a grand jury to investigate allegations of mishandling of classified information by Hillary Clinton and her associates. That's kind of interesting because it really should have happened. I mean, because there was enough evidence. And I mean, Comey came out and said it, you know, to everyone. He said that she mishandled these documents, these classified documents. And with everything that was coming out, there should have been a grand jury. And then the grand jury could have decided whether there was enough information, enough evidence that they could have probable cause against her. And that's what grand juries do. Remember, they don't decide whether somebody is guilty or innocent. What they do is they look at all the evidence and they decide by a majority vote whether there is enough evidence that supports the idea that that person committed that crime. Probable cause. That's what they have to meet. So, Anyway, they don't have to meet the same thing as like when you try somebody in front of a court and you have a jury, that kind of thing, they have to have beyond a reasonable doubt. And so it's a higher standard. There are some things that are evident. There's some evidence that can be allowed in front of a grand jury that will not be allowed in a regular court setting. So keep that in mind, too, as we think about all the things that are going to be happening. So anyway, that was a biggie there, number four, because really that should have happened. And remember, a lot of the people that are on this Judiciary Committee, on both Judiciary Committees, the one in the House and the Senate, are actually lawyers. I mean, not all of them are, but most of them are. So they have law degrees and they know what the process is and they know that should have happened. Number five, this, the, the Department of State and its employees' involvement in determining which communications of Secretary Clinton's and her associates to turn over for public scrutiny because, you know, they should not have been able to do that. That should have been, you know, when they subpoenaed her information and her emails all of them should have been turned over and then the Department of Justice should have been the one to decide what was allowed and what wasn't, or the FBI at least. 
And that is not what happened. You know, they made the decision themselves. And that's just not the way it works. <laughs> you know, try that in court. That's not going to happen. Oh, you subpoenaed me for all these documents? Well, you know what? Let me pick out the ones that I think you want. And I'll give you those. And then obliterate the other ones, okay? <laughs> so... Yeah, that's not how real justice works. Number six, WikiLeaks disclosures concerning the Clinton Foundation and its potentially unlawful international dealings. Okay, and we had testimony before Congress on that from Moynihan and Doyle. They testified in front of Congress that they had found that uh, the Clinton Foundation was working as a foreign agent and they were not registered with FARA. And so, yeah, they were in violation of that. Number seven, connections between the Clinton campaign or the Clinton Foundation and foreign entities, including those from Russia and U Ukraine. And now we're seeing the Ukraine come out. I mean, see, this is the thing. As I go through these, you're going to see, you know, we know about this stuff now. Back then, when he wrote this letter, this was in 2017. He already knew about it. These congressmen have known what the documentation is for a very long time. And they knew the corruption that was going on, but it's taken this long for it all to come out. I know it's frustrating. I'm with you on that. Believe me, I'd like to see it. But we have to follow the rule of law. We have to follow due process. And so everything is being put through the proper channels to make sure that it's all done very legally. That's very important. Okay, number eight, Mr. Comey's knowledge of the purchase of Uranium One by the company Rosatom, whether the approval of the sale was connected to any donations made to the Clinton Foundation, and what role Secretary Clinton played in the approval of that sale that had national security ramifications. Number nine, disclosures arising from unlawful access to the Democrat National Committee's computer systems, including inappropriate collusion between the DNC and the Clinton campaign to undermine Senator Bernie Sanders' presidential campaign. I mean, that was a crime right there, that they shafted him. I mean, Sanders really did have a case. Unfortunately, several Democrats actually tried to bring it to court, and it was dismissed, I believe. It was down in Florida that happened, you know, uh, right around where, where Debbie Wasserman Schultz is located. So it didn't really have much of a chance, I don't think. But, yeah, so... We know for sure that Bernie Sanders was shafted. <laughs> we know that from the DNC emails. Number 10, post-election accusations by the president that he was wiretapped by the previous administration and whether Mr. Comey and Ms. Lynch had any knowledge of efforts made by any federal agency to unlawfully monitor communications of then-candidate Trump or his associates. Number 11, selected leaks of classified information related to the unmasking of U.S. persons' identities incidentally collected upon by the intelligence community, including an assessment of whether anyone in the Obama administration, including Mr. Comey, Ms. Lynch, Ms. Susan Rice, Ms. Samantha Power, or other or others had any knowledge about the unmasking of individuals on then-candidate Trump's campaign team, transition team, or both, because we know that Flynn, the unmasking of Flynn was a felony that someone committed and that needs to be addressed, but it just kind of got pushed to the side. Nobody seems to be bothering with it, but they will. They will. And, you know, I know a lot of people say they want Trump to uh, pardon Flynn. I don't want him to pardon Flynn. I want Flynn to be exonerated, okay? And I think that's what's going to happen in the long run when all of this comes out, that really the charges will be totally dropped against him. And it's very unusual, too, that they've been putting off his sentencing, like, several times. Like, I think it's four or five times now. Five, maybe even six times. It's been put off several times. But that's because, if you read the plea deal, it's because he's working on covert law enforcement activities. It says that in his plea deal. So, yeah, I have a video on that one, too. Number 12, admitted leaks by Mr. Comey to Columbia. To Columbia University law professor Daniel Richmond regarding conversations between Mr. Comey and President Trump, how the leaked information was purposefully released to lead to the appointment of a special counsel and whether any classified information was included in the now infamous Comey memos. Number 13, Mr. Comey's and the FBI's apparent reliance on Fusion GPS in its investigation of the Trump campaign, including the company's creation of a dossier of information about Mr. Trump. 
that dossier's commission and dissemination in the months before and after the 2016 election, whether the FBI paid anyone connected to the dossier and intelligence sources of Fusion GPS or any person or company working for Fusion GPS and its affiliates, and, number 14, any and all potential leaks originated by Mr. Comey and provided to author Michael Schmidt dating back to 1993. And so... You know, you have the ability now to right the ship for the American people, so these investigations may proceed independently and impartially. The American public has a right to know the facts, all of them, surrounding the election and its aftermath. We urge you to appoint a second special counsel to ensure these troubling, unanswered questions are not rele- are not relegated to the dustbin of history. So you can see the names. This was all of the Republicans on that committee at the time. I don't know who that one is, but (laughs) love the signature. Yeah. But I'm sure they all look familiar and it's several pages here. Uh, yeah, several pages. So it does have all of them signing it. And you know, that's the situation that was in July. That was July 27th, 2017. Okay. That letter went out. I didn't see any immediate response, but this one, was another letter that they sent, and we write to renew this committee's recent call for a second special counsel. This was September 26th, and so they were, um, such a step is even more critical given the recent revelation that former FBI Director James Comey had prepared a statement ending the investigation into former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton before interviewing at least 17 key witnesses, including the former secretary herself. At least one former career FBI supervisor has characterized this action as so far out of bounds that it's not even in the stadium and clearly communicating to FBI executive staff where the investigation was going to go. So, yeah, that was, you know, definitely something that came out right before this in the news, and that's what sparked this letter And it's just basically asking the same things, you know, and it gives a little bit of the questioning of Comey here where they were trying to find things. And if you've never watched Ratcliffe, he does a really good job, too. Um, He's a good prosecutor. So anyway, they were asking about it. And here's, you know, they're talking about all of these. The decision was made before they interviewed these people you know, for Comey, he made the decision. And again, it's signed by Bob Goodlatte and Louis Gomert. I'll tell you what, Louis Gomert's really been in on this. And then it has some of the others down here. It's not all of them, but it's several. So anyway, that was another one that they had. Now, I did not find any response from the DOJ in between those two letters. There might have been something, but I have not found the documentation for it. However, there was another letter that came back after that. But before that happened, November 13th, we had this happen. And this was when Jeff Sessions appoints Utah U.S. Attorney John W. Huber to leadership position as member of the Attorney's General's Advisory Committee, the AGAC. And so that was very interesting. And what's really interesting about this article, I thought, was that you had this committee, and this was very common, that he announced these people. He was not the chairman of the committee. He was the vice chair. And I just thought it was really kind of weird that the whole article is about Huber when, you know, why wouldn't it have been about Richard Moore, who was the chair? You know, that just seemed really odd to me when I was going through it the first time. But anyway, this was an important event because November 13th, 2017, this was when Huber was appointed. This is when he started his work looking into all of those things that they just pointed out in their July, what, 27th letter. This one right here, those 14 things. That's what Huber was tasked to look into. All of those things. So... You know, when people are saying, oh, well, Huber's not doing anything, Huber is doing stuff. He really is. It's just that it hasn't come out yet because he's been a busy man. There's a lot in it. Now, remember, Huber is a U.S. attorney. That means that he can prosecute people. The problem we have with the IG, which is the Inspector General, Michael Horowitz, the problem with his office is he can't prosecute. All he can do is recommend. He he investigates. He and his people investigate. And he can just recommend that people be prosecuted. 
but he can't prosecute them. And so he really has no teeth, but he ha plays a very important role because his people investigate. And that's the first thing you have to have. So I came across this document too, this article from the Conservative Treehouse. And um, very interesting. Look at this. Friday night document surprise. By the way, Friday nights are pretty significant because a lot of times document dumps happen on Fridays. All right. So be prepared because I believe the 17th is this Friday. So I think we may be seeing something, some kind of document dump or something this week. Um, I, I think we're going to see Doug Collins. He's, he's going to release one or two more transcripts for, of testimonies. So that'll be interesting in and of itself. But I'm kind of wondering if, you know, May 17th, the two year anniversary of the whole Mueller thing starting, if we're not going to see some other documents dumped on that day, it'll be interesting to find out. Anyway, uh, but look at what this says. Well, 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 here's a surprise. Office of Inspector General has apparently begun giving Judiciary Chairman Bob Goodlatte the 1.2 million pages of evidence from the year-long Inspector General investigation in, into FBI and DOJ politicization. And I need to point this out to you because if Chairman Goodlatte had the 1.2 million pages that were given to Mueller because that's what, you know, the inspector general got them and then he passed them on, I believe, to Mueller. So why is Nadler so adamant? They have 1.2 million of the documents. That went to the Judiciary Committee and Nadler was part of the Judiciary Committee at the time. So why are they still complaining? Because there's a lot of documents there, and that's part of the evidence that was given to the Inspector General. That's what he had to look through, you know, to put out that whole Inspector General report that came out last June. And, you know, that's part of it. And so when they're asking for the Mueller report, 1.2 million pages of evidence are already in the possession of the Judiciary Committee. So the House Judiciary, Jerry Nadler, already has access to 1.2 million pages of the evidence. And he's still not happy. Just remember that. Keep that in mind. So I just thought that was very interesting. They're talking about Horowitz and it goes on. This is kind of an interesting little article. Especially, you know, when you're looking at it as a blast from the past because this came out in uh, da, da, where is it January 12th of 2018 and you're looking at these things and saying wow how come we just didn't get it like I've said before it's like having this big huge puzzle spread out in front of you and you have all of these pieces the individual pieces don't make a lot of sense until you have some of the puzzle completed and then they start making more and more sense and that's where we're at right now because a lot of the puzzle is starting to come together and the pieces are making more sense all the time and that's why I wanted to do this video because even though I did it several months ago with all these documents I really think people need to understand that the puzzle is starting to come together and things that you may have not really caught before maybe they'll make more sense now and you'll go wow that was already out there yeah it already was we just weren't really connecting well here is on March 6th there was another letter and this was from the um, House of Representatives and this was as a whole the Republicans as a whole and again they were saying look we want a special counsel, a second special counsel, to look into all of these things that are going on because we need this information. We need this looked into. And remember the list of 14 things that we went over. Those are the things they wanted looked into. Well, those are the things that Sessions tasked Huber to look into. And not just Huber. So we'll get to that in a minute. But anyway, if you go through this, you know, you can read this again. They were just asking for a second special counsel. Please appoint a special counsel to review decisions made and not 
made and not made by the Department of Justice and FBI in 2016 and 2017, including but not limited to evidence of bias by any employee or agent of the DOJ, FBI, other agencies involved in the investigation. So, by the way, if you read that um, IG report from June of last year, it didn't say there was no bias. What it says is Horowitz couldn't find evidence to support that there was enough that the bias had affected the outcome of their investigation or of the FBI's investigation. So in other words, he did point out that there was bias, especially in the text messages by Strzok and Page and some of the others. But there wasn't sufficient evidence from those to make a case. And that's what he was pointing out. But of course, everybody's taken it and they run off with this other thing. Oh, well, he didn't find any bias. Oh, yeah, he did. Read the whole report. He found bias. He found a lot of things. He found out that there were a bunch of... It, there's a chart in the back that shows that he found that there were people talking to reporters right and left and reporters talking to them and giving them you know, gifts and things so that they would leak information. So yeah, he found that out. That's charts in the back of the report. But of course, you're not seeing that on the mainstream media. Oh, oh no. So um, you have that. And, you know, he did say that there was bias. It's just that he was looking at it from the point of view of like a prosecutor. Even though there was bias, he didn't believe that he could prove or that a prosecutor could prove that the bias affected how they made their decisions, okay, Be with the information that he had. So I think that some of it's, you know, it's going to come out eventually what really happened. But at this point, that's what he was saying, that he couldn't prove the bias affected their decisions. And that is, that, you know, that's a tough thing to prove, okay? So that's why he did that. Well, after this, and this was again, March 6th of 2018. So these guys were really getting frustrated. Now there was a letter somewhere in between, I can't remember, somewhere around September, maybe from the DOJ. It was from our good friend, Stephen Boyd. And he basically said, you know, we're looking into it. We're looking into it. And it didn't say a whole lot, but it just said, we're looking into it. Well, then came this letter. Now, this letter is a piece of artwork done by Jeff Sessions. And so you really need to read the whole thing. Again, I'm not going to do it because this is going to be long enough the way it is, but I will give you some highlights. Anyway, this was a letter March 29th of 2018, and it was written to Chuck Grassley, Bob Goodlatte, Trey Gowdy, and they were the three that had been continually asking him, we need to have a second special counsel. And so he went through and he says, you know, I write in response to recent letters requesting the appointment of special counsel to review certain prosecutorial and investigative determinations made by the Department of Justice in 2016 and 2017. I take the concerns you raise seriously. And then he goes through and there, you know, he is a little bit wordy here and he, but he's trying to lay down his case. You know, again, these people are lawyers. They're used to building cases. And so sometimes it takes a little more words to build the case, but he goes through and he says, okay, here's the situation. I understand this is what's going on. And he says, as you are aware, I have asked the department's inspector general, Michael E. Horowitz to review certain matters that you and some members of your committees have raised in recent and previous letters. What are those things? What are the matters? The 14 things I read to you earlier. Yeah, that's what they are. So in addition to his ongoing investigation, the inspector general has now confirmed that he has opened a review into the department's compliance with certain legal requirements and department and FBI policies and procedures with respect to certain applications filed with the U.S. Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court. So what is he looking into? Well, we already got the information about the FBI and the struck and page and the bias going on there and the information about the problem with reporters that was going back and forth, which again, people don't seem to know that was in there, but it was, and everybody skips over it. But again, it was a chart at the end of the 
document, like in one of the appendices. You know, he's still looking into the FISA issue that there was problems and there were certain, you know, their compliance with certain legal requirements and department and FBI policies and procedures with respect to the FISA court. Yeah, that's what it was. And so that's what Horowitz has been looking into. He's been looking into all of this and it gives, you know, stuff like this, but look with this. He has to carry out these duties, Title V of the United States Code provides the Inspector General with broad discretion and significant investigative powers. And the reason Sessions is saying this is because he wanted to point out to them that a special counsel doesn't have this type of access. You know, they don't have this investigative powers, not the same level as what this guy has as Horowitz has. And the office currently employs approximately 470 staff, a significant number of whom are lawyers, auditors, and investigators who may exercise wide discretion on matters under their jurisdiction. If the inspector general finds evidence of a criminal, of criminal wrongdoing, he may refer it to a United States attorney who can then convene a grand jury or take other appropriate actions. To be clear, the inspector general has the authority to investigate allegations of wrongdoing, collect evidence through subpoena, and develop cases for presentation to the attorney general and the deputy attorney general for prosecution or other action. The inspector general also may, under appropriate circumstances, make information available to the public even if no criminal or disciplinary action is recommended. In contrast, this type of information would not normally be publicly available after the conclusion of a traditional criminal investigation. So see, that's the beauty of Horowitz. Horowitz can put things out into the public that you wouldn't normally be able to do if you, you were just doing a traditional criminal investigation. Anyway, he goes on and gives, you know, some of the lawyer speak here. I think it's required. And so then he, he continues on. And this was the one. Oh, I see. Um, it was November 13th was the letter that Stephen Boyd sent to the House Committee on the Judiciary. I already have directed senior federal prosecutors to evaluate certain issues previously raised by the committee. Now, notice he says, I have already directed senior federal prosecutors. That's plural. That's plural, folks. So Huber is not the only one. And if you happen to follow that particular letter of the alphabet, you know that in post number 2603, that he mentioned someone else, an outside prosecutor other than Huber that was working. So yeah, they've been out there. There's more than just him. You know, Durham is not the only one because it says here that he's put them out, you know, the senior prosecutors, he, he tasked them with that. And so for those people who say Sessions did nothing, Oh, you don't know. He was working behind the scenes. He may look like a little Keebler elf, but boy, he was hard at work. And there was a lot of stuff that he did, a lot of infrastructure that was laid to set the stage for Barr. Okay, and so in that letter, Mr. Boyd stated, these senior prosecutors will report directly to the Attorney General and the Deputy Attorney General as appropriate and will make recommendations as to whether any matters not currently under investigation should be opened, whether any matters cur currently under investigation require further resources, or whether any matters merit the appointment of a special counsel. So Sessions wasn't closing the door to a special counsel, but as he said above, the inspector general has a few things going for him that the special counsel wouldn't have. He has a very large staff to help him do this investigation. Okay. 470. And how many did Mueller have? He didn't have near that many. So yeah, they were really working hard. Specifically, I asked United States Attorney John W. Huber to lead this effort. Mr. Huber is an experienced federal prosecutor who was twice confirmed unanimously by the Senate as United States Attorney for the District of Utah in 2015 and 2017. And uh, he's done all these other things. And his perso he's personally prosecuted a number of high-profile cases and coordinated task forces focused against violent crime and terrorism. So, yeah, Huber was hard at work 
And the thing about him is that he is a U.S. attorney. So the U.S. attorney can do what? Impanel grand juries and can do the prosecution. So that's what he's been doing. Making cases, building cases. You know, it, it would seem like it could go a lot faster. But if you think that it's not going fast enough, you probably just don't understand the magnitude of what's going to happen. The number of people involved will be staggering. And that's something you have to remember. So anyway, that was this letter. And this was by Sessions. And so you really need to remember March 29th. That was the day that things really started ramping up. And so, you know, just to give you a little more perspective of what some of these people have been going through, you know, Bob Goodlatte was really fighting the good fight in 2017 and 2018. He had this guy that threatened him. You know, there have been a lot of death threats against these congressmen that are trying to do what's right. It's been very serious. And, you know, this is not an isolated incident. This is just one that I pulled up. So, you know, I really think that you need to remember that. Now, um, this article right here, especially if you follow that particular letter of the alphabet, you will have read this like, 10 zillion times because <laughs> it's been posted many, many, many times. But this is an article on Breitbart that talks about Jonathan Turley, who is a professor and he is considered a top national legal expert on government investigations. And he basically said that the idea of teaming up Huber and Horowitz was brilliant because it brought together, it combines all the powers of the U.S. Department of Justice's Inspector General with a prosecutor who can bring charges, seek indictments, and get results for President Trump far more quickly than a second special counsel. How long did it take Mueller? Just under two years. So we need to remember that. It took a long time for a special counsel. What's going on right now? It's already been going on since the very first appointment, which was November 13th, 2017. That's when Huber was appointed. So things have been moving since then. Yeah, it takes a long time to build cases. It really does. So this is a good article. I'll leave the link down below as usual with all the rest of them. If you look at this paragraph here, as a U.S. attorney, Huber has full authority to impanel a grand jury and to file criminal charges. A grand jury can be impaneled anywhere, which means that it could be a group of citizens from deep red Utah in the heart of Trump country instead of the D.C. swamp that decides whether to hand down indictments for felony prosecution. So that's an important part, too. You know, the majority of D.C. voted for Hillary. So maybe it's not the best place to impanel grand juries to try to get rid of the swamp. So I'll put that down below. Honestly, if you've not read this article, read it. Read it very carefully. It's full of a lot of good stuff. Anyway, I also want to point out to you that at this point, this was May 16, 2018, Sessions added 300 prosecutors. Now, it says to fight opioids, crime, and immigration offenses. But you got to wonder what umbrella that crime is, you know, part of. So kind of an interesting thing there. That was from USA Today. So, um, and as I said, if you're talking about Durham, well, what if there's another prosecutor outside of D.C. assigned by Sessions with the same mandate or authority? One for the history books? Not long now. And that was December 12th. So it's even closer now. That, by the way, post 2603. So you can go there and you can see it if you need to. But yeah, that's what I've got for you. I wanted to point this letter out particularly because this one is the keystone. This one unveils everything they were doing. It is definitely like the heart of the whole plan that's going on right now. So... I wanted to share that with you. I know that there are some people who have been with all this for a long time, but then there are others that are just now starting to wake up to everything that's been going on. And so I wanted to put this out there for those of you who maybe have not been part of this for very long and you don't know that these letters exist. I think these letters are excellent 
to share with other people and say, look, this has been going on for a very long time. Now, I want to make a caution here because there are a lot of people for a time, there were several articles and everything that were being written about Huber and they were saying, well, but we haven't heard anything about Huber. Remember, you're not supposed to hear about ongoing investigations. If you hear about ongoing investigations, somebody's leaking. And the thing is with Huber, if he is working with non-swamp creatures, the chances of leaking are very, very small and virtually non-existent. So there have been no leaks. And you got to remember that. That's why it may look like, oh, well, nothing's going on. Yeah, something's going on. And this Durham guy, he was appointed back there, I think, probably about the same time as Huber. I don't know if it was exactly the same time, but it definitely was by March 29th because he already talked about appointing prosecutors, plural. So, yeah, there's a lot more. And I think it's more than just Huber working on things. I think there are different ones working on different areas. So it could very well be. I know when Moynihan and Doyle testified that they were surprised that Huber didn't have the information about the Clinton Foundation. Well, it could very well be that Huber's not working on the Clinton Foundation. It could very well be that another attorney is working on that, another U.S. attorney. So I think there are several of them because there were 14 different things that they had to address. So it's very likely that there are different ones addressing those different issues. And I don't know how many of them there are, but I'd be willing to bet there's more than just two. <laughs> so that's my thoughts on it. Anyway, I want to thank you for stopping by and I want to thank you for the prayers for my computer. So like I said, the hard drive's not here yet. It's not installed, but the computer is limping along and doing well right now, which I'm just crossing my fingers. It's going to last until I get the hard drive and I can replace it. Then I get to reinstall everything again. Yay! <laughs> oh, so... Anyway, but you get a nice clean hard drive. You know, they tell you you should probably wipe it every so often to make it run faster. Maybe my computer will run at lightning speed. Woo, that'll be exciting. Anyway, so that's what I've got for tonight. I want to thank you for stopping by and I'll see you all later.